Now we're going to talk to Peter Sunde on Skype. And you can see me only if I stand over here. So he is, of course, uh, one of the founders of the Pirate Bay, uh, as well as uh, being part of Flatter and Hemlis. Uh, but I guess today is mostly about the dark side of innovation, being on the dark side of innovation, uh, which you are, Peter, right now, you could say. Because if you would come here, uh, you would risk being arrested. So therefore, you're on Skype somewhere where we don't actually know where you are. Um, so, Peter, tell us how it is to be a misfit in Kyra's words. I, I don't know why someone would call me a misfit. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. Hello. Hey. Uh, I really don't like being called the, being from the dark side because I think I'm from the bright side, the only bright side in both senses. Um, I really, uh, I loved what Kyra said, but it still is, uh, I think we should all... Uh, have different views on what the dark side really means. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about myself and uh, what I've been doing, so maybe you can laugh at that or something. So I, I am actually both a hacker and a pirate, uh, so I, I think I fit very well in with Kira's uh, previous two um, examples of people that go outside of the normal boundaries rather than being on the dark side, I, I think. So I started uh, with computers when I was like 9, 10 years old, and the only way we could use computers at that time almost 25 years ago, is by copying uh, everything that we could find. Games and software, everything was just copies of everything else. Uh, so that's what we did. And we never really thought about that, if that's good or bad. It was just the way it was. And that's kind of how we learned anything about computers and how we learned to, uh, to do whatever we did. And most of my friends from that time are today working in computers in the IT industry. Uh, and they have started lots of companies and everything. So... Uh, we never saw ourselves as criminals, but today we would definitely be considered that. So uh, when I grew up a bit, I found lots of other people that had a similar background, and they started a project called Piratbyrån, which was uh, a wordplay with a Swedish group called Antipiratbyrån, which was the Anti-Piracy Bureau. Um, so these guys, they started Piratbyrån by kind of showing that you could uh, improve things by copying and remixing. So you took anti Piratbyrån and turned into just Piratbyrån to show that the copy was better than the orig original instead. And it was kind of the way uh, that Piratbyrån behaved all the time. So Piratbyrån was kind of a lobby group that uh, discussed copyright and internet issues um, instead of just allowing the anti-pirates to just send out press releases saying copying is bad and so on. So they kind of wanted this um, um, discussion around uh, anything about the internet. And... Uh, well, uh, the, the way we did it with Piratbyrån was that we always kind of made fun of our opponents and we laughed at them and we uh, did lots of fun events. We've done everything from art to starting projects like the Pirate Bay. So out of this kind of uh, group of weird people, we had this uh, technology that we weren't really, it wasn't the key of Piratbyrån, but it was one of the biggest things that it, we ever did. Uh, and I think that we, we closed down Piratbyrån in like 2009 or something. Uh, and I think the only thing that I, I regret uh, that we ever did was actually calling ourselves pirates because it's really aesthetically ugly. I don't like the whole eye patch thing and so on. So that kind of sucked. Uh, but we started the Pirate Bay and you've probably seen the logo. It's like this, if you can see that. Um, it's one of the biggest sites uh, in the world. It still is and it's uh, growing. And it came out of this need of using a new technology instead of the old file sharing technology. So we wanted to show uh, the new technology called BitTorrent, which I guess all of you kind of know. And uh, it was not really anything from Pirate Bay that was a big innovation. The, the, the only thing that Pirate Bay did in order to grow to uh, a large extent was actually not closing down because everyone else closed down. So we didn't make any technology. We didn't do anything uh, clever. We didn't have good software. We just had everything that everyone else had, except being kind of stupid and having a goal set, what we wanted to achieve. And I think that the only thing we, we did was to not close down, and that was kind of the only goal. Uh, and I think that's the big difference between us and Casa and Napster and all of these guys, because they kind of gave up, because they had other, other goals than just being, uh, you know, there for the people. And just to to brag a little bit about the Pirate Bay, I know that you probably like the Pirate Bay quite a bit in, in the audience. Uh, Pirate Bay is at sometimes half of the internet traffic in the world. So half of everything flowing through the cables on the internet are users of the Pirate Bay. 
and Pirate Bay has never been more than three people doing this as a hobby project. And out of them is one is an alcoholic, one likes drugs, and there's a third guy as well. You can guess who's who. That's up to you. Um, but sometimes we've actually had issues like uh, someone from the crew um, just broke a cable in, because he was drunk in the computer center. And he actually tripped over a cable and half of the internet traffic vanished for three or four days. Uh, so it, it's kind of a weird situation where you have like one of the actual biggest sites ever in the world just for fun and totally not serious. So, so it's been very weird having this view of, uh, of Pirate Bay from one side where people think it's a huge business and they sent emails wanting to come to the head office or at least a local office somewhere to discuss things with us or, and so on. Just by, you know, it's been a typical internet project. Uh, we also, together with the Pirot Biron, Pirate Bay did a lot of uh, weird stuff. Like uh, we had a, a small, um, uh, went to a small art festival in, in Venice, quite big actually, uh, and did a project called Embassy of Piracy and was just uh, asking people to send in small triangles of paper where they, with their own uh, drawings on them. And we just took a lot of pictures and we sent people sent pictures of the internet and we printed them out and put them in a, in a small box so you can look at that. But the Italian police heard that the Pirate Bay was in Venice and they were totally upset about that. So they actually went to the Venice Spinal and uh, did a raid against the, the art festival uh, because they were upset the Pirate Bay was in, in Italy and we couldn't run Pirate Bay in Italy. So people are kind of confused about what Pirate Bay really is. Uh, and when Pirate Bay started growing to like this really large extent, people became very upset in kind of the opponents. Uh, and they started sending uh, threatening letters to Pirate Bay. And that's, I would say that's actually the thing that made Pirate Bay big. It's because they sent all of these threatening letters saying that we're going to sue you for all of the money in the world. Uh, and sometimes even more money than is actually printed. Um, and they're really upset when we actually started replying to those letters in a way that they didn't really like. So, for instance, I'm, I'm going to try and show you uh, something we did is we show them. Can you see this? It's a map of the world. So we show them where Europe was and where the U.S. was, because it was usually uh, companies from the U.S. that always sent threatening letters saying, like, we are breaking the uh, law in Illinois, you know, in Chicago, somewhere. You can't do that. So we just show them pictures of polar bears saying that, you know, we have polar bears in Sweden eating us. So we can't really discuss Illinois local copyright laws. Uh, and they didn't realize if we were joking or not. And they just stopped sending the letters because nothing happened. Um, and that was typically what people were upset about is that we didn't kind of cave in to the pressure from these companies. And they were really, really upset. Um, and we just thought it was fun. But uh, we also had this, I had this re revelation once. We did one of the first crowdfunding uh, things on the internet ever. We wanted to buy a small nation called Sealand, which is somewhere outside of Leeds in England. It's just a small platform and we wanted to buy it because it was for sale and we didn't know how much money it was they, they wanted for it or anything. And it was kind of a joke. We just wanted to like see if people would think it was a good idea. So we started collecting money and we got like $25,000 in, in one or two days. And uh, the people in Hollywood were really upset about this. So I remember waking up like two days after we started this project. I think we were still drunk, all of us. Um, and we had this... Um, I saw on, I think it was Larry King show on CNN or something like that, where one of the top lawyers from Disney and the Prince of Sealand were discussing what will happen when we buy Sealand, what will happen with international copyright legislation and so on. And they were really upset. And we just like drank beers and had pizza. That was the whole thing about it. And so people have, you know, there's weird things happening. Uh, so in the end, uh, Hollywood decided to send private investigators after us which I never really understood why, because we did everything on the internet, so you can't really see what we're doing by placing a car outside of our homes. But they, it kind of shows that we have different realities that we live in. Um, so in the end, uh, probably most of you know Pirate Bay from the big raid in 2006, where the uh, Swedish police sent like 40 police officers to take all of our servers, and they took 200 other servers as well. And uh, it was just like a big mess. And we decided to not close down Pirate Bay at that time either, which was kind of what they wanted. And that was probably the best PR stunt that Pirate Bay ever did, was like just reopening after two or three days again, uh, after that catastrophe. And the interesting thing was that um, you kind of get this feeling of how big Pirate Bay is also when you realize that uh, the raid was uh, an initiative from uh, Hollywood going to the White House, forcing the Swedish 
Minister of Justice to come there and talk to them about the pirate bay issue. Uh, and then them going back to Sweden and forcing the police to do a raid against uh, pirate bay just six weeks after they said that pirate bay was actually legal in Sweden. So uh, we kind of saw the issues we had with corruptions and so on in Sweden as well, because even the, the, the uh, judge in our case happened to work for the pro copyright society in Sweden and so on. So it's been just a mess. And I think it's boring to talk about because it's just a court case. Um, even though we lost, we kind of won the PR case anyhow. So that's the important thing. Uh, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about this whole piracy uh, thing is when we talk about piracy, we always talk about that as being like outside the law. And I, I think that's kind of, that's kind of stupid because we always look at what's, uh, what, what the law is, not what the law should be. And we always talk about how the industry should react to something. And I think the piracy is not just about uh, faults in the industry. It's more like faults in in what we can uh, use things for. So uh, I, I think that people are always looking for some sort of solution. We, I always hear that Spotify has solved the music problem with piracy. And for me, that's not true at all because there was, not an, uh, there was nothing to be solved. Uh, piracy gave, um, gave us the possibility to, to copy whatever so we could reach uh, new music and find new culture. And it's not about uh, just the distribution of it, which a lot of people talk about. So when they talk about Spotify, it's easy to access and so on. But when we use all of these solutions, uh, we forget that we have this, we, we lose control over all of our data, uh, just as we, we do with all of the cloud services on the internet. So I'm really, I'm really scared of uh, talking about solutions because I think we're too much focused on that. Um, and it's kind of the same thing when we talk about, you know, all of the new technology that comes out. Uh, we talk about innovation and we talk about iPads and smartphones and so on. Uh, I'm a little bit scared of those because I think it's not the, the perfect innovation because they are not meant for people to create things. They are meant for people to consume things. And previously we had a lot of discussions about how to be more creative and so on, but we don't have the tools anymore. We don't create tools for being creative. We create just consumerist tools nowadays, anyhow, mm -hmm. and instead. Um, one of the issues I had always with all of these discussions is, of course, that uh, when we talk about piracy, we always talk about people that, you know, don't create. But for me, it's more, there's always been this problem about who is supposed to be a creator. Is that um, we, we always talk about big musicians. We don't talk about the normal musicians that play music uh, as a hobby or just do it for fun or, or whatever reason you have to make music. It's not always to make money. So then we, I was part of starting something called Flatter which has this logo. I'm doing very analog things today, um, which is a, kind of a Facebook-like button. It's a system where you put money in every month and you decide how much money you want to spend on the internet. Uh, and instead of just giving like a small, uh, like $2 for a song, whatever, you decide I want to give two euros per month and you can go click lots of buttons on the internet and uh, the money just gets divided equally amongst them. And it kind of changes who is a creator because all of a sudden you can uh, just flatter a comment on an, a news article and that will actually be uh, money to someone who created something. So we can change kind of the value of creativity by looking at everything as creativity instead. Uh, and one of the things we learn with, with Flatter quite a lot is that uh, there are issues with not only distributing things on the internet, but also about distribution of, of money on the internet. So uh, in the midst of Flatter's kind of early startup days, uh, WikiLeaks got shut off uh, with their funding on the internet. Uh, and Visa and MasterCard and PayPal, all of these big companies, they just shut off every possibility WikiLeaks had of uh, getting money. So in the end, they came to Flatter, and we were the only way you, you could actually give money to, um, to WikiLeaks. Uh, it kind of shows the same problem we have with the Pirate Bay, is that people are really scared of standing up for uh, what's really important. So WikiLeaks had not been doing anything illegal. Pirate Bay has not done anything illegal. Uh, but at the same time, we all get treated as criminals because we are going against kind of the power. And I think it was really sad to see that Flatter was the only company that would, you know, kind of go against, uh, you know, the, the powerful corporations just to prove a point. And I think it's, it's not just a, a question about you know, piracy and so on and, and distribution, but it's, it's a question about freedom of speech and democracy in the basic of all of this. So uh, in Sweden, we had the FRA law, uh, wiretapping law uh, a couple of years ago. And we also had the iPad law, which allows uh, companies to go in and monitor the internet. So we started another project. Let's see if I have a sticker. 
it's called iPredator. It's uh, a VPN service which allows you to get uh, uh, encrypted internet connection. So you just connect to iPredator and then we, you connect to the internet encryptedly and um, no one can see who you are anymore. Uh, it's a very small and easy thing to do if you want to be anonymous on the internet. And people are really upset about us for being, uh, to allowing people to be anonymous, even though it's a human right. Because the, the discussion about what can be done and what can't be done on the internet is, is never about what we should do. So it's it's been really been really sad to see the discussions about uh, anonymity, uh, anonymity and so on uh, lately. It's, 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 it, uh, I can't speak today. Sorry, had too much coffee. Um, but uh, every, on, up until NSA and all of this prism and so on, we haven't really had a good discussion about our rights as people uh, online. And I think it c comes down to the same thing. It's all about um, using technology and so on to. To be anonymous, but it's not about it's not where the problem is. We should also do this politically and discuss what we want from our society. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, and I can't hear anything from anyone. I hear nothing. Two oh, something. minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I'll talk about Hamlet a little bit then. Um, so, as you said before, I also uh, helped started Hamlet, which was the first time I've done a project where people just get directly what it is. Uh, it's a small app like WhatsApp or uh, something for your, your phone, which allows you to communicate anonymously and using the same technology as with uh, IP data and so on. So we're kind of doing all of these things. And the reason for doing this is not because we want to be entrepreneurs or anything. I actually hate being called an entrepreneur because I'm not into this whole, I want to make money and be, you know, uh, successful and buy uh, a rocket ship, whatever people do with their money nowadays. Uh, I think that most entrepreneurs are, when they're successful, they turn into idiots and they want to be rock stars because we have this view of entrepreneurs as the new rock stars, but all of them are just, well, the same thing with rock stars and entrepreneurs, like big egos and lots of money and privileges. Uh, so we should stop celebrating entrepreneurs and just celebrate innovation instead. I talked for more than two minutes, I think. Yeah, okay, that, I, that's, that's it for me, thanks. All right.